Okay, so obviously color is uh, is relevant for us to discuss. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the, the fundamental vision theory uh, that we developed uh, in terms of doing basic image analysis uh, and so on and so forth it is normally quite scalable to handling color. But there are certain aspects of color uh, that uh, if we actually understand the, the underlying properties, uh, we can leverage the color information in a, in a much more uh, efficient manner. So color is uh, important because uh, obviously, uh, you know, the world doesn't exist in black and white or gray. Uh, it exists in color and of course modern sensors are all pretty much all color. There was a time when a lot of things were grayscale, but not anymore. And uh, color is something that uh, people have used extensively in order to sort of convey uh, various physical properties. Right? And uh, our ability to perceive color is uh, quite extensive. In fact, you know, most of the times we, we really rely on our ability to perceive color because our ability to perceive grayscale your illumination is actually quite limited. Uh, we, we can only tell a you know, few tens of shades of gray. But when it comes to color, we have a very, very wide gap. We can perceive a lot of different colors, but grayscale is very limited. Okay. So, so color becomes important uh, in understanding how we, as humans, perceive the world, and at the same time, it's a it's a truly a psychological property, right? And it's based on visual experiences. In fact, it's something that uh, is very difficult to interpret in terms of semantic links. So, for example, uh, you probably have encountered this all the time. When, when people talk about color, right, and if you bring it down to a specific color, sometimes uh, we don't necessarily agree on what color we are talking about. So I can, I can sit here and argue with you and talk about, you know, something that's green in color, just that it just happens that you actually don't see it as green, that you're actually calling it as something else. Now, the, the subtle differences in color, because they are psychological properties, can be uh, perceived in a, in a different way by individuals. Um, so, color it truly is a is a byproduct of the interaction of light with something that's physical, uh, and uh, it's a perception as part of how your rods and cones collectively will activate themselves with respect to a particular wavelength of light. So the sensation of the color is purely a, a function of the brain. It's what the brain perceives and based on that you will have a corresponding sense and an association of a semantic label to that sense, right? So I, I perceive yellow or I perceive green and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, in fact, uh, you, can, you can simulate these processes. So uh, you close your eyes and actually press on them, you'll probably see color, right? Because uh, it's, a, it's a reaction of how your brain is perceiving that and your brain will trigger a corresponding response to it. Um, now, in a more physical sense, you know, we understand the, the spectrum of light, right? The wavelength of light uh, or uh, wavelength of, uh, of, of a particular energy being emitted. And in a more physics-based sense, that's how we define color. We define color in terms of the actual wavelength of energy that's propagating uh, through space and, and actually interacting with the physical matter. So, uh, light in general um, is also differentially reflected. Right? When, when we actually perceive the color of an object, it is now a combination of the wavelength of light being illuminated, that illuminates the particular object. The object's ability to actually take that energy and convert it into reflected energy, but as part of the conversion process, it may also offer a shift in the wavelength. So what we are perceiving is actually a combination of a particular wavelength of light interacting with a physical matter and the resultant of 
So uh, what we perceive is is relatively complex. Um, now keep in mind that uh, different material will react with specific variants of light in a very different way. Uh, and uh, you know, it may it may have different properties of different materials. Uh, may actually result in, in different phenomena that typically we describe uh, in different imaging processes. For example, fluorescence. Right? Fluorescence is something um, where a particular wavelength of light excites an object, but because of that interaction, the object will then emit light in a very different wavelength. Right? And the shift in that wavelength uh, could be both either in the visible range or a invisible range. Right? And generally a higher shift is typically what we associate with uh, fluorescence phenomena. So broadly, we understand the EM spectrum. Right? So uh, basically, uh, there's different wavelengths of light energy being uh, propagated. And for us, in terms of perception, human perception, our sensitivity is typically within the range of 400 to 700 nanometers. Um, beyond these wavelengths, we don't really sense a whole lot. We, we don't gather much energy. Right? And in fact, uh, we see a dominant amount of our energy uh, here. It's just how the human radio system evolved over time. It's also because of the fact that if you look at the, the EM uh, energy emitted by sun, the dominant light source for us at least, is because it's, it's mostly within that range. Right? You do have other bursts of energy coming through, but it's, it's fairly small. Now, if we are to look at color as a property, then we have to go back and say, well, what is then our interpretation of radiometry? Right? You looked at radiosity in terms of illumination. Right? We, we have so far discussed about radiosity only in terms of pure illumination. But now, if we have to address color, we are saying that it's actually the illumination is an integral over multiple wavelengths. So how do I break that term up and define radiometry with respect to a specific color? So what that means is almost all the terms we have looked at so far, we have to now define them in terms of per unit wavelength. So we talk about now, rather than just radiosity, spectral radiosity. Uh, radiance becomes spectral radiance, in which case we would basically look at watts per square meter per subtended angle per unit wavelength. Okay. Now, in general, almost every object, physical object, will have a particular property to absorb or transmit light. When we look at reflected images, Right, so typical imaging uh, where you have a luminance source, we have a camera that is actually taking in light that's reflected from the object surfaces. Over there, we truly care about what is the reflectance property of objects. And the reflectance property of objects will vary according to wavelength. So for example, let's say you know you're looking at some object you have a source of light coming in, and if I were to say, well, what is now my spectral radiance? Not just radiance, because so far we only talked about radiance of the object. But now we are talking about what is the spectral radiance of the object. So if I had to look at the spectral radiance of the object, it's a matter of saying, how does my object emit different wavelengths of Light. So one can end up with what you call a reflectance profile for an object. A lot of energy the object will actually emit out at different wavelengths. For the matter, the illuminant that we have is also not something that's constant. We have to look at that now in terms of a spectral illuminant. So as a result, the amount of energy transmitted by the illuminant may be defined by an illumination curve line. If I look at a curve like that, you can kind of see that you know, obviously it can transmit a lot of energy at higher wavelengths as opposed to lower wavelengths. Okay? So the color signal that we are actually going to perceive is the 
combination of the two. And you can come back to what we've seen so far in terms of pure energy being measured off of the surface of an object as being now an integral over this curve. But if I have to break that up into a per unit measure, then this is what you would end up with saying that you know, at 500 nanometers, this is the amount of energy that I will sense. Now, of course, the same thing applies in terms of transmittance, right? So if you're looking at this in a, in a uh, imaging modality, like um, where, where the images are formed because of not reflectance of the energy, but transmittance of the energy, so amount of energy actually absorbed by the object, then the same principle still applies. Nothing changes. Except that now you will have what you may consider a transmittance profile for that. The amount of energy that's actually absorbed or the inverse of that is, is being represented, the amount of energy that would be transmitted through the object. Now, we can actually go and say, you know, if this is how color is represented, then obviously the color of what we consider uh, semantic objects may not be uh, a single value. Right? So obviously it's some kind of a tropa. It's a, it's a curve over the daily space. So what is the color, let's say, of sky? And if we measure this under different conditions, what we find is that the color will be represented by all the different curves. Right? So uh, on a cloudless sky, just before sunset, this is the kind of color that we would perceive. This is the curve that we would perceive on a cloudless sky at sunset. The bright snow and the visible gray skies or you know, sun behind the cloud and so on. So obviously you can see that the, the color perception is changing, not because the sky is changing, uh, but because illumination energy is different, or for the matter, the velocity is actually different. What we are perceiving in the camera, because of all the properties that we've talked about so far, right? shadowing, interreflections, and so on and so on. We basically have a constant illumination source in this case, okay, which has a spectral profile, obviously. You have the same object that you're sensing, but the color that you will sense will be different because of the global illumination effects. Okay. Different objects interacting in different ways, the different amount of light getting absorbed, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, we can do the same thing in terms of illuminance, right? Different sources of light. So, for example, I may have a particular illuminant which may have a light profile or a spectral profile that looks like that, like a red curve. But I may take another illuminant and it may have a completely different profile. So, now one can go back and say that, well, why do I sense different colors? It may be because the object is exactly the same, but the illuminant is changing. Because remember, the, the color that we are sensing is the illuminant multiplied by the property of how the object will react to light. So some reflective property, let's say, of the object. So if the object is the same, nothing else is changing, if this illuminant is changing, obviously we're going to see a change in color. So this can become quite problematic, right? Because for most imaging conditions, neither do we have a good idea on what my <laughs> color of the illuminant is, neither do I know the property or the reflectance property of the object. So what do I do with color information that I pick up? How do I trace it back? So, one thing that we have talked about in the past is 
albedo, right? Albedo as a property of the object. So now, in terms of color, we can talk about spectral albedos. Right? What is the spectral albedo of an object? And again, we can now start generating albedo curves for different objects. So these are for different leaves, for example. These are different leaves that are different plants and so on and so forth. And each one has a spectral albedo. Now, if I know the spectral albedo of something, then now I have an ability to establish some relationship between different illuminants and what I sense. Now, for practical purposes, and certainly in the, in the world of visual reproductions, we have tried to standardize the way we depict colors. Uh, and most of these, you can think of them as cartoon spectra that we have designed. Right? So if you go and say, you know, what is red, green, and blue? Right? Most of the times when you work with digital data, images, for example, they will have uh, values and intensity values represented as red, green, and blue values. Right? Now, what are those? In reality, we have kind of designed these to be these cartoon values. In the sense that everything between 400 and 500 will call blue. 500 and 600 is green and 600 and 700 is red. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, you also have mostly in print reproductions to use a uh, rather an editor model or subtractive model giving colors such as sign, red, and yellow, which are these particular corresponding blocks. So magenta would be a combination of blue and red in this particular case. So the RGB model that we typically use is what is known as an additive color mixing model, which means that we have defined these as independent models, but you actually can add the two spectra to realize a new color. So, for example, red and green mixed together gives you yellow, where yellow is now this particular way, 500, 700. And these are what we typically use for you know, like monitors and, and to, in order to generate colors and so on and so forth. It's all editor mixing. For print production, on the other hand, we use more subtractive models or multiplicator mixing. Okay? So where you basically are looking at, let's say, a combination of cyan and yellow, which gives you green. And if you do that, basically you're finding the union uh, or the, uh, the intersection. And you find the intersection and you end up with the corresponding bracket and then it comes. How is the rise in practice? How is this model actually the rise in practice? You are actually uh, doing a, a point by point uh, because we are using these colors, right? Natural dyes, I guess. Uh, and basically you are knowing the dye and, and if you want green, you will add equal quantities of this and this. So that's how you realize the color. Right? And every color that you have is some discrete pocket. And what you are doing is adding the equal values in order to maintain that particular discrete pocket. So if I want, let's say, uh, a color that besides here, right? then you will basically add this and this in amounts that give you that much residue. Now, keep in mind, and that's one of the reasons, the question is how do I get the residual, how do I negate the rest? So that's why in uh, printers, you actually don't just rely on sun and red and yellow, you actually have black. So black is what you actually use in order to suppress the rest. Yes, yes, oh yes, yes, yeah. So now, uh, of course, you know, this is fine uh, in terms of qualitative reproduction, right? Uh, for us, uh, that doesn't work. I mean, we, we are going to use these things somehow to compute, quantify what we are perceiving in an image, right? So uh, we want quantitative information coming out. So how do we specify the color in terms of numerical values? Um, because keep in mind, I mean, numerical values are important. Uh, a lot of times we'll, we'll go and specify colors and say, well, this is exactly what I want, right? So 
it, it's my ability to sense something is not quite there. Uh, and uh, how do I uh, use color in terms of descriptions? And uh, also, you know, colors are uh, semantic labels that change uh, not only from person to person, but even culturally certain semantic labels change. You know, uh, across cultures in general, maybe, you know, the common set that you'll find is probably tens, maybe twenty colors at best. Everything outside of that, you know, everyone calls something different. Even even uh, in the U.S., I mean, you know, uh, it's, it's quite amazing. Uh, you know, I perceive to be uh, you know, just a, another color. You know, has uh, a variety of names. Like, you know, I see orange; it's orange. But you know, there's peach and there's what not associated with that particular color and different shades of it. And and uh, all these, how do we quantify? Right. So there are. Perception, me perceptual mechanisms in order to quantify this, right? And, and uh, most of the time we do this based on what is known as color matching. So the idea is relatively simple, right? I have basically some particular light source that's going to emit a color. Right? And then I can quantify because I can measure the spectrum. Right? I can describe that light in color in terms of spectrum. On the other hand, I can say, well, I want to generate an additive model. So I will go out and create three lights, right, or limit sources that I describe as red, green, and blue. The spectral profiles of which are defined. So what I call red, what I call green, or what I call blue is three set. And yeah, I mean, ideally I would prefer them to be just nice little uh, ideal brackets, but then maybe they're not ideal. It doesn't matter what they are. But it's something that we have standardized and we can call them as red, green, blue. Now the question is, if I want to describe a particular color, how do I do it? Right? I can try to tweak the percentages of red, green, and blue that I add together in order to reproduce that particular color. And that's exactly what we do in color matching experiments. Right? So uh, you can have a person sitting in front of a screen and generate a high partner field. You say, you know, this is my test. Illumination, the surrounding field is going to be something that's neutral. Now, the primary lights have to be used in order to modulate the amount of energy in order to reproduce that color. Once you do it, you have a sense of what is the amounts that are mixed together for the three primaries. So we do that, we do a color matching experiment. I'll say, well, you know, this is on the left is my color. Uh, on the right, I have three primaries that I want to mix together, right? So I will change the amounts in which I mix them together and so on and so forth. And I say, ah, okay, that's what I get, right? So this is the amount of P1, P2, and P3 that I would add together in order to reproduce the color. Great, I can keep doing this, okay? And for different colors, I can end up with different things. You may end up also in situations where, you know, of course, uh, not all additive relationships may give you the particular color. So if that happens, then you have to come back to this slide and say, well, maybe I have to add a primary over here in order to change this color in order to get the appropriate match. In which case, the addition here is nothing but a subtraction. Okay. So we can do this. Now, the, these uh, experiments on humans work uh, reasonably well. I mean, most people will be able to figure out a primary set in order to match the color that they are seeing. Now, for most people, it's always going to be one set. Very few people may end up with two sets of primaries in order to generate the same color. Okay. So the reality is that you know I can generate a particular color not by a unique combination of P1, P2, and P3, but there might be more than one combination of P1 and P2 and P3 that realize the same color. But most people don't, don't end up with that. Okay? So for most people, making this kind of a match makes a lot of sense. It's, it's knowing how much to add to get a particular color. Okay? So these are the basic trichromats. Now, keep in mind this is a purely linear model. Right? We are realizing a color purely as a addition of so if it's a purely linear model, then a lot of other linear properties will apply. Right? So it doesn't matter how I add P1, P2, and P3. Right? 
it will always, the addition is the result, right? So the way I add them doesn't matter. Furthermore, if I want to scale things, right, I apply the scale to my equal scale to all my primaries and an equal scale to my light source, right, matching source, then everything should match. So scale variations across all of them should not matter. And then so on and so forth. These are all basic Grassmann laws or linear laws that apply. Um, so the general paradigm that people have used is that, you know, I, I generate this kind of a matching system. I will end to identify three primary colors. I will find the amounts of each primary E1, E2, and E3 in order to generate a particular match to a spectral signal T. Right? And those amounts that I end up with, E1, E2, and E3, will describe every color for T. So I'm creating a linear relationship. Now the question is, how do we, of course, present this and do this mathematically? Right. Uh, so, well, of course, we have to design some set of experiments. And people have done that. And based on those set of experiments, we can generate these curves. So I define a specific set of primaries. These are the primaries that I have. These are the specific wavelengths that I use, 645.2 for P1, 525.3 for P2, and so on and so forth. And I end up generating these curves in order to match many different keys. So, great. So how does this translate to something that you want to measure? So the relationship that we actually build based on this is this representation. Right? So the curve that we generate is nothing but these curves, right? Discrete values in the matrix that I can be present. Like C1 for lambda 1 to Cn for lambda n. So I have C1, C2, C3, so I have these columns now, where for every particular wavelength, I have a corresponding correspondence, uh, uh, corresponding medium function. So which means that when I have a particular spectral signal, this is the spectral signal that we actually generated, off of which these curves are defined. So I can always, given this curve, this is the underlying matching color. Now, amount of each color that we, we have for that particular perception system is defined as the integral of C1 and the corresponding C values. That's the color that we are sensing. Now, how do we translate this color to other primary systems or other color systems? So, of course, this particular set of color primaries are not going to be available to us somewhere else. But our job is to maintain the integral to be the same wherever we go. So, how do we translate that? Well, it's relatively easy to do because let's say we end up with a new set of primary. We can measure what the primary is. Right? So, now we can generate uh, a particular mixing value for each wave. So I end up with a new primary, we'll call it P prime. For that particular primary, I want to get a color matching function C prime. So the desired color that I have, I can generate an equa equation over here, or I mean, but it's a uh, matching representation. Let's say that given a signal T, right? If my color matching function is C prime as my primaries are P prime, I can actually go back to using my original primaries, which are defined under this relationship, C T, right? This relationship should remain the same. So the way I ensure that relationship remains the same is basically saying that, well, this is my primary that I'm currently using. So the signal that I'm actually sensing is some C prime of P times the P prime. If I actually multiply that with C, I should go back to my original measurements on the original parameters. Just in the so This is what I'm keeping constant and I'm solving for these. This over here, this entire system, is the color that match to T that is described by the original parameters, P, under which we generate the curves. 
and the inner portion is the percentage of match to P that is based on using some other primes. So it, it turns out this is nice uh, in terms of simple matrix translations, multiplication. So what we really need is not, we don't really care what T is, right? because that's actually some full spectral set of all colors. So maybe we have a same on either side, you can actually get rid of them. And what you end up with is essentially the CP prime, which is nothing but a 3 by 3 matrix, comprised of the old primaries and the new primaries for the color matching function. So everything that relates to the original color, to a new color, becomes some kind of a translation, matrix translation, 3 by 3 translation. The relationship in by 3 by 3 is simply defining the translation from one to the other. So now if I know what the translation is, then I can take any color that I get, apply the translation and go to a deep color. And that's how I can equate things together. I can basically normalize everything and bring everyone into a common transformation set. So these, when we bring them into a common transformation set, are also referred to as metamorphs. Right? So you can have two spectra, T and S, right? they are actually perceptually matched to each other. They will be matched where C, T will be equal to C, S, and C is the color matching function for some set of primates. So for example, what happens is that this is a, an effect of taking some key okay, being multiplied by your mixing matrix or your color primary matrix and you end up actually getting the integral to be the same. So you could have scenarios where you can take very different light sources with very different spectra but they will be perceived to be exactly the same. So, for example, you know, you can go out and, um, well, I mean, the simplest example of a good metamer is uh, to go out to a, you go out to buy light, and uh, you want to, to go out and buy light source that uh, mimics uh, the illumination of the sun. It's impossible to go back and regenerate the exact spectra of what the sun is emitting in terms of energy. But we can actually measure that color and generate a metamer of it, which is the same integral response to color, it's just that we need a new spectra for it. Right? So while P e and S can be different, the realization of multiplication with C gives you the exact same response. So that's how we can recreate multiple light sources that give you the same effect. Now, how do how do these things work in the eye? Right. Um, of course, the eye doesn't actually uh, do this. The the eye um, the sensing system uh, you know is relatively uh, straightforward in the sense that we have discrete sensors in our eyes and we have discrete sensors that are receptive to different wavelengths of light. Okay? So if I look at look at what my sensors are in the eye, basically they are made up of rods and cones. Cones are the ones that are actually responsible for color sensing. Rods don't really provide us with color information, they are purely there in order to, to sense the, the integral amount of light that is coming in. Okay? Um, now, in general, cones are concentrated around the phobia, the center of the eye. Uh, so, your peripheral vision is, is kind of weak in terms of color, right? Almost all the color we sense is, is based on our central vision system, okay? 
Now, the sensitivity of rods and poles is very different in the sense that you, know, as you get sort of more in terms of darker illumination, rods are the ones that, that provide us most of our sensing. Poles are the ones that are actually provide us most of the sensing in terms of normal illumination, ambient illumination, daylight conditions, and so on and so forth. Okay? Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, in general we can't read in, read in dark, uh, because uh, in the dark, uh, you, know, you are mostly functioning off of your rods. Keep in mind the rod uh, may be absent in your central foliation, so when you're trying to read something, you just can't see it, because uh, the amount of light coming off of that is so little that we, some of it we perceive in the peripheral vision, but nothing in your central vision. So it becomes very difficult for us to read in low light conditions. Now, in terms of primaries, our main sensors in the eye, the color sensors, which are cones, they also can be thought of in terms of primaries, three primaries. Right? And in fact, that's what we have, three discrete types of sensors. We have MNS for you know, the long range, uh, medium range, and, and the short range sensors that we have. Uh, which are capable of capable of sensing sort of in the blue range, the green range, and the red range. Because you know the nice, they're not these uh, nice uh, cartoon spectra, the continuous spectra. Right? They overlap. And in general, the ratio of these sensors that we have is such that you know we have a lot of sensors that are sort of in the, the uh, long range, and so red sensing, uh, a fair amount in the green sensing, and of course in the blue sensing, we are very very few. In fact, in the main center of the fovea, we almost have no sensors that pick up blue light. We, we predominantly operate in terms of red and green sensing. Okay. So, if I were to look at a cone mosaic, right, the distribution of sensors in the cone, the distribution of cones in the fovea, this is kind of what it would look like. You see that the center is mostly all red in the green sensor, no blue. As you go away from the center, you start seeing more and more blue sensing cones. So, for us, the color perception that we get is actually the integral response of all these cones. And in general, there will be some power response coming from all the cones. So there will be some curve over all the wavelengths of light coming in. And this continuous curve will define the kind of color response that your brain provides. So rods and cones, they, they kind of act like filters. And in order to get the response of the filter, you're going to multiply essentially the response curve of each sensor with respect to the spectrum of light that's incoming. When I say multiply, it's actually not multiply. It's convolution. It's been what? Now, the question is, does each cone yield one number? Right. Well, we can think of it as one number because it's actually an integral response. Right. The, the perception of color for the brain is, is instantaneous. So, uh, we perceive it at an instance of the result. It's, it's an integral measure over what you may call unit time. So that, in, in, from that perspective, is one number coming off of it. Of course, uh, in reality, that number is changing with the, let's say, whatever the unit time is for the firing of the neuron. So now, of course, uh, the obvious question is, if that's what we think color is, then from the digital image standpoint, you know, we don't have this nice continuous response. We simply are providing this as three numbers. So how do we go from this curve to three numbers? So one solution to that is to say, well, I would like red to be you know, this uh, 600 to 700 bucket. I'll integrate the amount of energy in that bucket, maybe that's the number I report as my red So I, I integrate things within each bucket and report that as a single value. 
that's how I come up with red, green, and blue assignment for a digital image. So, yes, very good. So how do we get a single number as opposed to something that's changing, right? But from a digital representation, you know, remember what we have done is already generated this profile is an integral of exposure time. So the reality is we, we actually don't know an instantaneous value, we only know it over unit time, and the unit time is our exposure value, right, for a sensor. So that's what we measure in terms of an integral amount, RG. So if we, if we have a kind of sensor, we can fit the capital fit the signal, we can work with the time period for the exposure time. So that's how we assign uh, these three discrete values. Well, uh, apart from the fact that you're still going through a spectral response function. So if you remember when we talked about the camera, we talked about a response function. Right? Now, you have to convert the response function to also a spectral response function as opposed to just a response function. It's, it's a, it's a, it acts as a modulator of uh, the actual spectral energy that you have in each pocket being converted to what the sensor can actually measure. So it's going to be some modulating function that says that if I get this amount of energy, what is it going to actually map to in terms of measurable intensity? Absolutely, it's a transfer function of the So, that's the kind of how we get the value for red. Right? We know this is the spectral response function or the transfer function. We're going to integrate over that and say, well, that's the amount of energy I can report as one value. Okay. And then you do it for green, you do it for blue. So what you also see over here is the fact that there's actually these three values are not independent. Okay. There's an overlap between all these three values. As a result, they're actually not independent values. They're correlated in some way. But that creates an interesting challenge because generally when you process color kind of images, you just say, well, you know, I have three channels, I'll process them separately. And you never worry about the fact that maybe they're correlated. Okay, so, all right. Well, people have done very interesting studies on, on the human vision system. And if you look, uh, this is an actual picture, micrograph, of what the cones look like, sort of in the center of the eye. You find that they are very nicely packed, very uniform distribution, same size, and so on. Now, when you go more towards the periphery, you start seeing that you know the size of the cones actually grow, but they also become sparse. And between those spaces is your rocks. So, and of course, uh, one of the things you should notice here is that the approximate shape of the sensors is. Hexagonal. So, uh, as an interesting aside, there is actually um, interesting research, just an image processing, right? Uh, and also in terms of sensor design, to go back and say, you know, well, do we really have to design sensors which have rectangular eyes? Why not design them to have this kind of type? Uh, of course, uh, from a digital perspective, processing will be quite challenging. Uh, so now we can't do nice little traversal and roll the columns. But uh, we have come up with a different pattern. But uh, the fact that you, know, you can actually get much more compact and dense sensing if you actually have sensors like that as opposed to the same area, can actually pack more sensors. Uh, 
Okay, so in general, you know, this uh, are things that people have measured, um, have established the spectral sensitivities of, of the human senses. Uh, and and you, you've seen what they look like. These are all normalized sensitivity curves, right? So they, they will always be between 0 and 1. Uh, but uh, these are for the three different sensor types we have. Okay, now, since we know that we can define color, Right, using almost any set of primary colors. Right? Uh, we obviously would like to agree on some set <laughs> that universally we can all use and say, well, this is a set everyone will measure up to. Right? That's the only way we can standardize definition of color because we will always try to match it to that particular primary set. Right? No matter where you collect your image, you will always convert it back into that primary set. Right? So what is that primary set? So, you know, the one that typically uh, people use uh, and the one that we actually started out with is the XYZ color space. Okay, and this was designed uh, back in 1931. Um, and and it, it all it did was provide a physical realization of these primary sets. Okay? And what that means is that it was purely an additive realization. If you actually derived it based on physical realization of primaries, you know, the reality is we can only add things. We cannot subtract things, right, in order to generate color, light. So it was purely additive, okay? And as a result, this is what the XYZ standard looked like. These were the three set of primaries, X, Y, and Z, that were used. And you can see that uh, they're kind of not that nice in the sense that X is a primary that has two big peaks, okay? And then you have Y and Z. And, and obviously they overlap. And they, it doesn't really matter. It was just a set of some primaries that one had to come up with. Now in order to convert all of this into some kind of a, a uh, color matching function space, it, you know, people simply generated you know, a normalization. So they took X and Y and divided it by the sum of the three. So you ended up with going from a 3D space to a 2D space. And the 2D space basically looked like this. So what you have is, uh, you know, you start with some x, y value that gives you the value for x, I mean red, <laughs> on one end, you know, the green, and then coming down to green. Now, in, in general, the intersection of sort of the centroid on the of this particular space was where white would reside, because that would have equal amounts of uh, red, green, and blue. And saturation was increasing uh, in specific radial orientation. So, if you actually look at the color composition within the space, this is what the space looks like. So, white in the center, you have red, green, blue, then shades of each of these colors. So, this is the CIE XYZ color space. Okay. Now, in general, the the uh, people could also map a variety of light sources into this color space. Right? So where is sunlight? Where is a normal again, this is a light source? Daylight illumination and so on and so forth. Basically, all of those typically fall on a curve that goes sort of from red to white towards blue. Most of the light sources that we, we see, artificial light sources are going to be dominated mostly in the longer range wavelengths. So for example, what you perceive here right now, white, you know, this is uh, actually uh, is emitting a lot of, you know, long range wavelengths. Sun, for that example, I mean, sun emits a lot of IR, a lot of red light coming through. You don't necessarily see it like that, but you know, a lot of red light coming through. Now, one of the problems with this particular color space was that our, our ability to match color, especially in quantitative manner, requires that we establish some kind of a distance relationship. So how do I know how far a particular color is from some other color? Typically we say, you know, uh, if I have an XY space, you would prefer to say, well, you know, x1 minus x2, y1 minus y2, or you know, some kind of a squared Euclidean measure, right? x1 minus x2 squared. 
squared plus y on minus y to squared. The root of that. That's how far I am. Yeah. Great. So obviously that's what people want to do. So if I go and look at this particular space, unfortunately, the separation in colors is not uniform across the space. So if I were to actually measure an equidistant separation between colors, I would find that in the blue space, the equidistant separation would be much smaller than in the green region, or on the matter in the red region. Furthermore, they're not even symmetric. They're defined by these ellipses. So this become, became a problem. Now, this figure is actually a more of an exaggeration. The true Y spread is defined over there. But uh, if you were to blow it up, this is kind of what it would look like. Right? So perceptually, it is, is appropriate. Okay? So this was problematic. And we can't really use this kind of a measure uh, for doing quantitative analysis because then I would now account for where I am and I would somehow scale that. It's quite painful. So from there, we sort of said, well, let's create this transform space where I try to normalize this distance metric. So I want to create a transformation from my xy space to go into a new space where it doesn't matter where I am, the same distance would imply the same separation between colors. So that's how the UV space came about. Okay? Uh, and, and in the UV space, you find that, well, these are what the separations of colors look like. Not perfect, but it's a little better than what we have in the XY. And we kind of use this a lot as approximations uh, and say, well, you know, this will just measure some nice you know, L2 distances and we are happy. It's an approximation and it's good enough. Now, in general, you know, if you want to use these, and you know, typically if you start at the field, uh, color models are typically used initially for coding purposes, right? Uh, for coding purposes, if I want to use things, then, uh, it, you know, what is the fundamental notion of video coding or image coding? How do we achieve coding or compression? Most compression models are predictive models. Furthermore, most compression models are linear predictive models. Which makes you say that you know I have a model that says that the previous plus some value gives me the next. So rather than sending the previous value, I'll simply send you the error value or the difference value. And you take what you have recorded from the previous step, add the new value, and I get a new prediction. That's my recovered image. So, if you want to do that, and then, you know, obviously, for that you would prefer that these distances are the same every day. But you don't want to say that, you know, well, because of this color, I have a completely different end value for green versus red versus blue. Addition is addition. I simply want to add everything So, for video coding again, this would be useful to e equalize things, normalize things. Now, in general, color appearance itself is uh, going to be affected by multiple factors. Right? We actually get affected by nearby color. Uh, adaptation is a process that we get affected by, and of course, the state of mind, right? where we are and what we are thinking at that any given time. So here's a great example, right? If I, if you look at an image like this, right? I don't know if you can perceive that, but you know, for me, the yellow in the red region is much brighter than the yellow in the green. So our ability to sense this is based on surrounding colors. Right? So surrounding colors affect our ability to perceive what true color is. Of course, in reality, right? I mean, it's the same. There's no difference, but the perception doesn't agree there. Now, even for adaptation purposes, right, I mean, keep in mind our, our ability to perceive color is an integral measure of some unit time. But, you know, keep in mind we integrate only at a certain time intervals. It's not something that we continuously do. So if you actually look at this for a long time, right, you have now a stable firing sequence, 
that says, you know, this is the amount of energy that I'm integrating for my spectral response. And that's what we are seeing. And then all of a sudden you switch, right? You, you, you see that the original intensity di doesn't die out immediately. So look at the red, for example. Okay, when I'm switching, of course, I'm not changing the amount of energy for red. But what should, you should be seeing is that all of a sudden, there should be decreasing intensity, right? So think of it as, as a residual carryover. Before you adapt to this, you are now saying that you know integrating something which is all red, or fixed it on that, and then all of a sudden you are changing, but now you have to integrate multiple things. So all of a sudden this value is going to drop for a while before it comes back up. So. Again, this is a problem, right? Our, our perception is restricted to these time windows, uh, and, and that's not natural for us. I mean, in terms of color constancy, that's not how color changes. So color constancy is, a, is an interesting uh, thing to address in terms of computational problems, right? So coming back to what we did in terms of radiosity calculation, so we assumed a lot of constancies over there, specular constancies and, you know, uh, membership surfaces, amino constancies and whatnot. But, you know, when things change, what we acquire as an image may not necessarily translate to that. Because all of these are integral measures and, and so as a result, we have now say, you know, well, how do I deal with color constancy in, in uh, my perception or, or computational scenarios? All right, so obviously anything that we realize in terms of uh, surface reconstruction and so on and so forth, we want to understand my illuminant description, right? my profile for the illuminant. I need to understand my spectral profile for the object itself in terms of its spectral albedo maybe, or maybe the spectral radiosity. Okay. And then of course, uh, in general, I want to perceive multiple kinds of what color is the object? Uh, what is the color of light? So I want to be able to decompose the scene to actually get these measures back. So color constancy uh, is, is something that we can actually study. Right? So let's say that uh, you have the same scene illuminated by two different lights. Let's say this is white light. Uh, you have something that you're sensing, right? and I can I can look at sort of regions on this image, uh, and different regions on the image, and say what are the underlying colors. Right? So if we can perceive some colors, and of course uh, the idea is that uh, objects that have some underlying color should maintain a constancy of that color, independent of the illuminant. So, how do we actually account for that? Um, now, if I were to look at the actual sensed color in my so-called some normalized color space, right? In this case, my CIE XYZ space or XY space, I would find that if I have uniform reflectance coming off of some object. But my light source is changing. The color that I perceive under different light sources will actually vary. It will move around in that space. Okay. Now, if I actually look at a different object under the same light sources, then I would find, of course, the perceived color is different because I'm looking at a different native color of the object. But the way the different lights actually get perceived the variance of that is not that different, right? So each light source, common light source, will shift the color in a consistent manner. So if I look at an object under green light, or if I look at the same object under white light, yes, my perceived color is different, but there is a proportional shift in my perception because the underlying object color is different.
And we can actually see this, and people have done this for multiple kinds of objects, right? So things that are natural, they have an underlying natural color, will remain the same, right? So as long as I can somehow remove the effects of my illuminant color, the underlying color of the object will persist. Make sense? Okay. Now, in perception, of course, we also sense things based on neighboring colors. Right? Adjacent colors play a very important role in what we perceive. So what do you perceive here, for example? So for me, you know, I see dark blue, light blue, kind of red, grayish. What do you guys see? Something along those lines? Okay. All right. Now, Sorry, so if you keep a sort of an eye on the same blocks, okay, I'm not going to change those blocks. I'm going to shuffle around the rest of the blocks. Okay. What do you see? For me, at least, I see all of them to be kind of greenish. I don't see them now, you know, blue and red and so on. Now, if I actually arrange corresponding colors next to them, I, I kind of start seeing them to be more related to the color next to me. So it's very interesting that the, our ability to perceive the color actually is, is not just based on the actual color, right? Because in this case, I'm not changing the light source. I'm not changing the illumination spectrum in this room. Okay? But what you are changing is the neighboring relationships or neighboring colors. So what I'm sensing in terms of color is also kind of dependent on what my neighboring colors are. Now, which is a very interesting perception problem or quality And partly because, uh, you know, we, we are generating color representations based on dependency relationships. We don't expect that things change in color space dramatically. We, we expect that there is some notion of constants, there is some notion of continuity of color. And of course, uh, yes, there can be dramatic changes, but those happen under scenarios where I cannot ascertain or enforce a constant demand. So in this case, I mean, you know, I, I perceive this to be gray, I don't see any constancy around it. So this is kind of like edge detection, except these are gradients in the color space as opposed to in purely in the density space. Now, what are the users and of color actually in, in computer vision, right? So how do we use them in, in our processing and, and computational properties? And so the use of color started out uh, kind of late, primarily because we didn't have that many color sensors around. But you know, 90s came around, color sensors started appearing. We started thinking of how to use color. Right? And, and the first use of color was relatively simple sense that, well, now I'm getting RGB values out of my sensor. So let's just use RGB values and do something with it. Right? So how do I uh, apply color in, in order to associate objects or regions of different objects? Okay. So I look at RGB values, I can construct a histogram of RGB values, and anything else having a similar histogram of RGB values, well, maybe they are the same. Right? Because, well, integrally they look like their appearance is the same, so they must be the same. So that was kind of the first use 
of color histograms in trying to index and retrieve objects that were similar to each other. Great, so we, and this was all based on RGB histograms, right? Later, people actually said, well, you know, this is interesting. We can use these kind of models to design representations for physical structures, for example, skin. You know, skin should have a unique color representation. People call it doing that and apply it for segmentation and things like that. And, well, it was okay. It doesn't work very well, but uh, it was applied and, and interesting results and formulations were found. And of course, we use color, of course, in uh, now in a variety of ways uh, for solving fundamental limit segmentation problems and so on and so forth. And, and you, you are seeing now, of course, color being used a lot, right, uh, in, in variety of formulations. But some of these are very early formulations and some of the, the ones where how color representations have evolved over the years. In fact, uh, I don't know if you guys know of uh, this competition called Robocop. Right? Uh, it's basically uh, robots playing soccer. And, and over there, I mean, everything is, is, a lot of it is driven based on color. Trying to get uh, the ball in the goal, and uh, with the, uh, you don't want to confuse uh, the ball with everything else. So, the simplest and fastest way of getting a reaction on a robot is to say, Here's my scene, find the ball. Okay. The ball is always the same color. So, easiest is the color segmentation. The problem is, uh, you know, the fundamental problem over here, I think, color is the perception of that color will change. Depending on what sharp shadows fall on that, depending on how the relation environment is and so on and so forth. Right? So, so if you go back to sort of papers that were in the robot, uh, the earliest models were in, you know the color of the ball, who trained the model for it, not like you know, they went out on the field, they completely collapsed. Right? Because uh, they trained on what would be images of this, but you know, you go into a corner somewhere, or, or the you know, other robots are surrounding the ball. And I don't see the color in it. So there's a big change in color. In fact, uh, um, a few years back, there was a more, more recent paper on, on trying to build color models where people said that, well, it's impossible to build a color model that seems to stay constant under all the different illumination parameters. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go back up to go and solve for a wonderful, you know, uh, albedo model. Right? I didn't use that for all the time. It's the albedo. But I can't. I don't have time to get the nerves through all those modifications. So, people have gone out and created what they call ensemble color models. So, they say, you know, they can't find a single transformation that gives me the same color representation and the different illuminations. So, I go and create these representations under all possible illuminants and I create an ensemble representation. Meantime, I go into that ensemble and create the and well, they said, okay, they could do a little better. Yes, there are. Uh, but, but again, I mean, uh, yes, there are. And, and that's what we typically use in order to reason a little bit about constants of color. Right? But uh, it doesn't necessarily translate uh, very well into this. Uh, so, under, keep in mind, all of those models work very well when you have uh, a simplified color model, right? Keep in mind, we have a simplified color model expressed based on primates. All of these are derived from that. When you come into a real environment, you are going to have color which is not only based on primates, but everything else in the world, which we are not accounted. So, under primaries, we have a perfect model. Perfect, and you, know, you saw the model, right? We have, so, uh, variations in color are not necessarily perfectly uh, normal, right? They're not perfectly ingredient. We approximate them. Right? But now you add the complexity of, you know, the effect of spectral radiosity from all the other objects. That we don't have an explanation for under the primary model. 
Okay, now, you know, so there are multiple, uh, large number of papers, right, which basically have used color and, and show how much we can do with color. And then the reality is we can do quite a bit. Uh, in fact, uh, it's very interesting, some of the, the uh, more recent work has actually used color more in terms of constancies to ascertain whether you know, this is actually a falsification or an artificial event being generated as opposed to something that's natural. And uh, it's very interesting that you can actually uh, use these constancy models to, to understand that. Okay, so let's come back to our, our typical sensed values of color on a, on a digital sensor or a digital image. So what we have is RGB color space, right? So what is the RGB color space? Represent, right? The three axes of color. Keep in mind, we typically represent them as being independent values. And of course, you have within that, uh, if you were to look at the because each value goes from 0 to some value equal to 255, right? So I have three axes, and the result now are the cube, which is 255 by 255. So if I were to look at the diagonal, right, it goes from 0, 0, 0 to 255,255,255. That's the line of grains. Right? Because that's the line on which you have equal amounts of all the three values. And basically, that is your going from black to white. That's all shades of grain. That's what a color space is. And that particular diagonal axis that you have is your luminance axis. Okay? Now, if you want to go from there to a CMI space, the mind itself, subtractive space, right? So being a subtractive space, the way you compute CMI is nothing but you look at the max value of R, G, and P that you have, and you take the corresponding value, subtract. So that gives you an equivalent representation of CMI. Now, in general, of course, to, to do complete reproduction of all the colors, you have to have black channel as well. Right? So. You, you have to add black into the mix. That's why typically you have the CM by K representation. Now, there are other spaces. Uh, for example, there's a YIQ space, right, which is also used commonly where I, Y is your luminance value. I is actually red minus the sine value. And Q is the magenta minus the green value. Okay, so that's the another representation. And typically the transformation defined for the YIQ representation is given by this P by P values. Okay. So I can go from my RGB values into this YIQ value. Now these values, the reason they exist is because this is what typically is used for you know, your, your television and, and video transmission uh, signals and so on and so forth. So for NTSC coding and so on. Uh, and of course, uh, black and white, and we have black and white televisions, would actually use just the Y would be enough to, to depict the corresponding grayscale representation of the underlying color signal. Okay. We, we don't really use YIQ color spaces all that much and computation uh, today, but that's where they came from. Now, some of the spaces that we actually use quite often in computational uh, uses, one of them being the HLS space. Okay. An HLS space is basically uh, Q, luminance, and saturation space. So the way it's computed is L is again the luminance value, so it's simply the R plus U plus P. S is your saturation, which is actually defined according to this particular equation. And then you have your uh, U value, which is given by T as the corresponding of computing. But the intuitive notion of understanding the space is the fact that it's a conical space where in the center, the central line of this cone is basically a luminous space, going from black to white. Within this cone, you have these circles. Each circle is nothing but every particular luminous value it defines the colors. So the circle defines all the colors that I have. And the magnitude away from the center line, all that circle defines the amount of, uh, sorry, the saturation that I have for the color. Okay. So the circle will define the U actually, because I'm 
And that's what actually gives us a color representation. So, now, uh, if I, uh, I'll show you what this uh, will look like in color. Of course, along the central line, you will not have any color. You don't see any color because all you see is shades of gray. As you move away from it, uh, you actually see changing saturation. So, you know, you actually see brightness in this. But also, along the angular direction of the circle, the color will Now, of course, how do we use these color values for processing purposes, right? Um, now, in general, when you get a color image, it's a vectorial image. Right? Every point has a vectorial color value. Um, and that will be dependent on the illumination conditions. Right? So, do we actually create models where we process these as vectors, or do we process them as independent values? And, uh, well, the reality is that uh, it's, it's difficult uh, for us to, to pick one or the other. There is value in, in doing both. Uh, but in general, looking at raw RGB values may not be the solution we are looking for for color processing of digital images to start. And the reason being this. If I actually take an image with a flash, I will probably get this digital image. Now, of course, under a different light source, same image will look very different. Now, if I treat these as either as vectorial RGB patterns, I may not be able to recover the same information that I get here, just as here. Uh, and so the question is, how do I ascertain with, without having being dependent on the light source, some notion of the fact that this color is the same as this color? That's what eventually I want to do. If I want to do scene level processing, that's what I need. I need to somehow normalize the color that I see because of different illuminations, sources. Okay. So same same thing happening here. With different light sources, things will appear different in terms of color. Okay. So knowing the real RGB value itself may not help me do interpretation of what's in the scene. So, of course, uh, scientifically, the best thing we can do is, is first calibrate our illuminant before we actually go and acquire an image. So, if I know and calibrate my illuminant, then I know how to actually transform my RGB values so that everything appears in some normalized sense. So, remember, if I know my illuminant curve and I get my output, I can normalize everything and say, well, I can deconvolve my output values with my input transfer and response function and get back my some normalized reflectance curve. Right? So if I have that, then it doesn't matter where I am, it should appear the same for the same option. Well, that would be great, but we can't probably do that all the time. Right? If I could, that's what I would do. Now, in reality, I, I still have to just deal with, in most cases, images that I get, and in some cases, uh, uh, you know, grayscale images or vectorial color images. So, for color images, I can choose one of two types of processing. One, what I typically refer as marginal processing, or the other is a vectorial processing. Marginal processing being where I just treat each one separately, independently. I process all three, get some result, and somehow combine the result in order to make some interpretation. Or I can do vectorial processing, right? Uh, so this is marginal processing. I, I have some process that is a scalar process. I get the result and move on. Or I can do a vectorial processing where I combine the three and treat it as a vector and then get some result uh, as a vector. Now there's problems uh, associated with what may consider, we may consider false coloring, right? So let's say that uh, I'm going to do some vectorial processing on this. And uh, the reality is that if I do vectorial processing, this image under a particular vectorial process may appear like this. Or 
if I were to process this image in a marginal form, it may appear like that. And the operation that I would look at would be a simple operation in medium. Right? If you want to do a medium filtering on this image, and treat it as a marginal image, right? so I look at the corresponding red value, green value, blue value, compute the median filter result, right? so some 3 by 3 block, 5 by 3 block, whatever you want to choose, pick a median value at the location, independently for red, independent for green, independent for blue. I will end up with a filter image that looks like that, and you can kind of see that. Medium. If I want to do vectorial median, I would get that. And that's also distortion. Not really what I want. Right? Make sense? So each one of them gives me a false color in my filtered image. And this is a very simple operation. So the question becomes what do I do? Right? If I if I do either marginal or vectorial processing. I may not get the right answer. So this is the actual example calculation. So if you have RGB values at a given location, and I simply look at the marginal median, this is what I get, right? So I compute the median of R separately, the median of green separately, and median of blue separately. So I get this value. If I do vectorial median, I just pick the middle value, and I get 0, 100, 0. So obviously the results are not the same, they are different. Um, question being now, which one is the correct result? I don't know, I don't know. And chances are that neither are correct, of course, as you saw in the previous example, if my intent was to do filtering. So there are some problems, and as a result, RGB processing in its native form is probably not the appropriate way for us to process images and you have to look at alternate color spaces. Okay. And the idea of looking at alternate color spaces would be the fact that you want to decorrelate the color channels. If you truly want to do marginal processing, you should do it within the fact that they're independent. And that way the marginalization makes sense. So I should generate a color space which is truly independent below the fact that our these that we get are not independent from each other. So maybe that's what I want to do. So we look at principal components of RGB. I want to bring information uh, which actually makes sense in terms of perception models. Right? So I look at view saturation and brightness values and design color spaces based on that. And of course I want to ensure perceptual uniformity. Right? So when I actually look at these color spaces, I want to make sure that if I compare things, you know, they compare uniformly across the entire space of color. And I don't want to worry about where I am in order to compare this. Right. So we will look at some interesting color models and compare them to see which might be appropriate for us to use in, in terms of digital processing. Okay. We'll look at that next time. Okay. All right. Any questions on uh, any of this uh, that we've looked at today? Stop here for the day. Uh